Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Innovators Connect and welcome to today's session on innovation excellence. Um, our guest for the session is Rich Turin. He is the international best-selling author of Innovation Lab Excellence, Digital Transformation from Within, and an award-winning executive with more than 20 years of experience in fintech innovation. He's an independent fintech and AI consultant helping clients navigate the uncharted waters associated with the latest cognitive technologies. He previously headed uh, FinTech for IBM Cognitive Studios in Singapore and worked for IBM in China. He resides in Shanghai and is writing his next book on China's FinTech scene, which I guess might become a very uh, thick book, right? Um, learn more uh, for, of uh, Richard at richdurin.com. Um, I'm really looking forward to the session. Uh, before we start, I want to do a quick shout out to our partners for making this virtual summit possible. So thanks to Planbox, IDScale, Board of Innovation, Alpha, Mural, and Chromatic. Um, then I would like you to know that there is a chat box and a Q&A box available in the webinar tool. Um, most cases it's somewhere in the bottom, uh, but in, in other cases it might be in one of the corners. Just click there, uh, Q&A or chat function, and let uh, us know any questions or comments. I will uh, feed them uh, for Richard uh, to answer. So with that being said, Richard, I'm keen to dive in. So welcome. Sure. Thank you very much, Hans. And thank you, everyone out there in Innovation Lab. Um, a quick thought. If you could give Hans questions I'll, as we're doing the presentation, I think it will make it a lot more lively because we'll get, I will cover your questions and this will be um, special or custom for you. So to look, we're gonna talk about innovation labs today and we're gonna talk about how to make them better. And now the artwork that I have on my first slide here of my PowerPoint is really, really important because it says from this moment, despair ends and tactics begin. And I think that's a really good place to start because I know that some people in labs are, I won't say in despair, some truly are, but most are saying, well, how can we do more? How can we be more effective in our, um, in our jobs to bring innovation to whatever company is hiring you or, or you work for? Okay, so let's look at what, the, so what we're gonna talk about today are the tactics that you can use to do more, to make innovation more, um, make your innovation program more useful. So um, where we're gonna start is just to take a look. You know, the question is, well, how big is innovation? Well, I wrote this book about a year and a half, I guess since when I started writing it. and. Virtually every couple of days, I do a search for innovation labs on Google. And you know what I found for about the last two years? Usually more than half the entries, if you do a Google search for innovation lab, are all about new and expanding labs. So it's really big. There is massive growth in the innovation sector and more companies are using innovation labs. And that's fantastic. Innovation labs are a fundamentally efficient way of bringing digital experts and other experts into your institution so that you can innovate. They, it's, a, it's a format that works. Um, many companies are using it not because it's bad, because it's fundamentally good. So big growth, big growth in innovation labs. But what I noted when I was in Singapore is that many labs are what I would call on this border of failing or not bringing innovation into their parent as they'd like to. And in some cases you can assign blame to the labs and in some cases you can assign blame to the parent. But the trick is not to really assign the blame. The trick is really to get at the root of what the problems are. So I think many, many labs could fundamentally be doing more. And we're gonna look at some techniques or what I call best practices that will help labs perform better. Now, here's a, here's a statistic that just blew my mind. When somebody says, well, innovation labs are performing well, and the answer is sure, why, why not? Because most labs are new technology for the companies that run them. So the managers who decide, hey, we're gonna, the C-level managers who decide we're gonna do a lab, they don't know what to do with it once they get it. So 82% of them run innovation the same way as they do regular operations, which I think 
for most of us, if we think about it, that we're all innovators, I'm assuming on this phone call, or a majority of us are, um, that would be a fundamental mistake. So again, let's look, how can we get away from this tactic of running them the same way? So how did I write this book and how did I get into this? Look, I was an innovator in banking for many, many years. I ran small teams that designed new fixed income products that had never been done before. And I used JavaScript and computers and coders and everything that we used in the digital age, I've been using since the early 1990s, but I ran small teams, usually about somewhere between six and 10 people, all dedicated to innovating and designing new products. So when I took this job at IBM Labs, I actually transferred down from IBM China where I had been, wor had been working, um, I, my job at IBM was to innovate and help banks mostly with their innovation programs. And all of the banks in Singapore at that time were opening up innovation labs. And I got, as part of my job, to meet with all of the different people who ran the labs or worked in the labs because I was, of course, working for IBM. So we were working on Watson AI and we were working on Hyperledger blockchain and my team at IBM serviced them. So I got a chance to meet and talk to all of these different lab people. And you know what I saw? I saw stress. I didn't see young, happy people. What I really saw was mostly people who were unhappy or in some way less than thrilled with their new, um, their new innovation lab experience. So what I saw was fundamentally a company that had invested tremendous amounts of money in some of the youngest and brightest people in their company, and they were actually miserable. And well, what was one of the things that was at the root of this? Many actually believed the mission statements that the companies put forward saying that they could achieve anything. So I'm sure that's a controversial statement, but what happened is, especially in the banking uh, environment, we had lots of banks hiring in people from Google and from, from the tech side, and there were significant constraints on what they could do with banking. So this concept that you can achieve anything really wasn't accurate. So number one problem with innovation labs, don't believe the mission statements, right? So yes, you can innovate and you can do great things and you can achieve anything with caveats that it has to be helpful to the organization you're working in. So for me, I thought labs were fundamentally sick and that they had actual symptoms of illness. And the way I looked at this is that as a doctor, maybe perhaps not Dr. Strange, but my mission was to start to look at all these different labs, see what their different problems were. And, and what I found is that many of the labs shared the same problems. And if you look at modern medicine, what we want to do is treat the cause. The symptom may have been that young people were less happy than they should be working in this great laboratory. Um, but what was the cause? What's at the root of this? And I wanted to look at it from sort of almost like a medical perspective. So um, what I did was I started to, to find what the common pain points and the causes of stress for innovators were throughout these labs. Now you could say that these are causes of stress, but you could also say that these are the key areas where labs underperformed. It was their underperformance in these specific areas that held them back, that made them less effective than they could be. So we're gonna take a couple of these points. We've only got a short time today. Um, but we're going to look through, um, out of this dozen, we're probably going to do about four, I believe, and we can add a few more depending on time. But um, these are essentially the medical concept, or these are symptoms uh, of, of the problem. So let's look, at the, let's look at them. And here's the thing. The point is that I understand that not all labs will have these problems. Um, the point is that you can pick and choose which of these uh, problems is relevant for your laboratory. And the most important thing is the way I designed and wrote the book, it was designed to start a dialogue between the stakeholders in the lab. So there are essentially three stakeholders in any lab. The people working in the 
laboratory, stakeholder number one. Number two, the C-level executives who pay for the lab and decided to, to start it. And the third one are the business units, or what I call BUs, that um, actually have to use the lab services. And my heart goes out to them because most of the people in the BU, they are people who have great careers and do great things in whatever company, but innovation was usually not part of their job specification and it's completely new to them. So the, the book was really designed to start a dialogue. So let's jump into it and look at one of about four um, areas that I picked out that are really critical for uh, making your lab work. Now, the biggest problem that we see or that I saw with labs, and it's why it's number one, is that the labs were practically invisible to the business. So here's a typical lab, and it's really wonderful to see this. I've got a C-level executive who proclaims to the world that, hey, innovation is the absolutely most important thing for our company. And then they take their lab and they locate it 10 miles away from the main offices with absolutely no contact with any of the business heads who are back in the home office, right? How many there have a lab that may or may not fit that, uh, fit that um, description? So there's a fundamental problem in that labs are not separate from the rest of the business. And it's a real issue when I go to a meeting like I just did about a week and a half, two weeks ago. I had a meeting with Chinese banks here and I asked them, well, who is your head of innovation? You have an innovation lab? Yes, we have an innovation. Who is the head of the innovation lab? I'd love to meet them. Silence. Why there's silence? Because the lab, even though it's part of the organization, is not actually known to the people who are running the businesses. And that's like my telltale uh, failure point where people don't even know who heads the, heads the lab. So really the solution to this invisibility is to exactly obviously the obvious, the, or, or sorry, it's obviously the opposite, which is to become highly visible and to take laboratory people and make sure that they go out and work with the different business units so that they have a real experience working and knowing what the, uh, the business problems are for that particular company. So the concept that the lab has to have its own space is fine. I'm not arguing that innovators need some sort of space where they can try things without somebody looking over their shoulder and saying, boy, that was a really bad idea, that's terrible. Look, we're all, we all know that failure is key to an innovation lab. But at the same time, even if you are separate from um, whatever uh, main business units in your company, we have to break down this barrier between the business units and the lab so that we're all working together. And that's absolutely critical because here's what I see that happened. Here's what I saw that happen. The further apart the lab is from the business units, the easier it is for people in the business units to pick on the labs. They say very simply, the lab isn't doing anything. I don't know what happens over there. Um, it's nice that we have a lab, but I don't know what those guys do. And they're over there doing their own thing and they don't help me. And with time, there's a certain resentment that grows between the labs and potentially the, um, the business units. So break those barriers, send people from the lab into the um, business units, integrate them in some way so that they start to understand what the real problems of the company are. And I see Hans here. Yes, there is a question. Uh, Edward is asking, invisible to business, what do you think about Skunkworks model? And if highly visible, what's the risk of being just only incremental? Okay, there are two questions there. First about the Skunkworks and then about incremental versus transformational disruptive innovation. Okay, the first one was Skunk's work, Skunk Works was highly visible. It's a great example. And yes, uh, Edward, thank you for asking that. I think you, you must have my book because I think that's chapter three or four. So I appreciate the question. I absolutely love it. Um, but Skunk Works was highly visible within Lockheed and it was a place where Lockheed employees wanted to go. So yes, um, 
it was highly visible. Now, um, the issue of incremental versus dis disruptive or transformational, I don't like to use the word disruptive. In fact, we're gonna, well, I guess we're not going to talk about that, but that's a, that's that's one of my pain points. I'll maybe mention it later. But um, there is no way that you're going to get um, this transformational uh, innovation in your company unless you're talking to people. And in fact, we're going to cover that in about two or three sections where I talk about the big plan. Okay, so if you have a large transformational innovation plan for your organization, great, I'm not knocking it. But if you're doing that large, big plan sort of innovation, and you don't have discussions with the people who are running the business, they're going to kill you. They're not going to kill you because your idea is good or bad or whatever. They're going to kill you simply for the psychological reason that they have not been included. We're talking about, and yes, if you've got a, if you've got a real transformational solution, you're usually talking about stuff that's going to impact senior managers, guys who have been at this company for their entire career. And you know what? You may have the greatest idea in the world, but they're not going to like it. Why? Because they were not included. So if you want to do transformational um, solutions for your company, you have to include the business units and senior people from within because you're going to get killed without it. And I'm going to come back to that because there's a couple of other things coming up that are that are very much relevant to that. Um, focus on tech. Or So now, just so you know, we're going out of order. I have 12 of these and I picked out four of them, in sp especially for this presentation because we're not going a full hour. Um, but there's another problem that I saw with many, many labs. And that, does th that is that they are focusing on technology. So best example is a lab that I knew down in Singapore, and they were super focused on blockchain. And they built blockchain, they used blockchain, they were all about blockchain. And you know what? The lab people probably got pretty, pretty smart about whatever version of blockchain code they were using, which escapes me at the moment. But the point is this, as good as they were about blockchain, they were really bad with people. So let me make a comment about labs. It is much easier for a lab to show progress. And that's what this lab did. They showed fantastic progress about what they were doing with blockchain. Great, they are becoming better and better at blockchain. Let me ask you something, who cares? You can be the best lab with blockchain out there. But unless you're talking to the people who will use the blockchain product that you're, or blockchain solution that you're building, and unless you get their buy-in, it's not going to work. So the solution is not to focus on technology, but to focus on the people, not the technology. Um, the key is that the laboratory has to change people's relationship to technology. It's not about how good the lab can be at building a blockchain solution. It's getting the people who will use it broken in on blockchain, showing it how it will make their lives somehow better, and getting their buy-in. And that's absolutely key. And we talked about transformational innovation where things really change the company. If you can't get this buy-in, and if you can't get people involved in getting them to love your technology, you're never going to get it off the ground. And it's sad. It should be, well, this technology is great. We will all use it. You know, we should all be like Spock from Star Trek where, we're, where we are completely analytical. But sadly, in, in innovation, it's not like that. We have to sell and we have to very gently persuade people that our ideas, our innovation is worthy of their time and of their acceptance. So again, it's this concept of soliciting the business units and getting them to like what you're doing. Okay, um, the fourth one that I'm going to talk about, and this is the one that I really get the most pushback from uh, lab managers, is this one. It's called carte blanche. Carte blanche is the expression of having freedom. And the picture here, obviously, is of the Statue of Liberty, the symbol of freedom, and of course, handcuffs, right, which are chaining you down. So one of the things that I saw, especially in the early days of labs, is that the C-level managers would actually tell the lab people, hey, go innovate whatever you wanted 
to innovate. There can be no more dangerous place for a lab to be than innovating with the remit of doing anything you want. That's terrifying. And if you've got that remit, that's nice, but it's, it's a double-edged sword and very dangerous. So the opposite and the solution to this is to say no to this. Actually, if you actually have some reasonable restraints on the direction that your innovation should be going in and constraints in as maybe what, what you can do with it, which divisions you should be working with, these are all good. Constraints help innovation labs do more. They help labs focus themselves on the problems that the C-level executives really think are important and worthy of the lab's time. So um, what, what I found was uh, labs going out and innovating and they'd come up with uh, some products and then they'd bring them to the um, C-level or business unit people in their company and they were all shot down. Well, of course they were shot down. They were building solutions to problems that the senior management didn't think either didn't acknowledge as a problem wouldn't acknowledge as a problem or didn't believe were worthy of implementing because they didn't feel that it was relevant to their business. So say no to carte blanche. Look for some constraints in how you innovate. Now, I know that's hard because most innovation managers want, we are innovators, me too, I want as much freedom as I can get. Give it to me by the pound, please, right? But the issue is really that be careful what you wish for, because if you get too much freedom, you can be going in directions that um, management doesn't really want. And now there's a problem with this. All innovation labs are on a fuse. The fuse is lit when you get in there and you've got two to three years to show that you are valuable to these, um, to the executives and to the business units. So it is absolutely critical that the time be used effectively and innovating in areas um, with some constraints so that you know where to be where you know where to be innovating. So this is Homer. Homer is of course the absolute king of the big plan. Homer Simpson has every episode, he has some phenomenally large plan that of course fails as he as he has here, right? Um, so we the question that came in before was wonderful and it was about incremental versus transformational innovation. And I am all for innovation labs having big plans. There is nothing wrong with that and I support them wholeheartedly. What I don't support and I think is very dangerous for labs is to have these singular large plans. And I've met them and where um, you go to a lab and they say, we are here for one thing. And what's that? We're going to put blockchain on our, um, on our remittance where we're going to put it in our, on our back, back offices somewhere. And we're going, to, we're going to clear out the back office and we're going to put blockchain in there because that's the solution that will fix everything. And these are really very, very dangerous propositions. Not that the, the idea is bad in any way, but if the lab is focused on one singular goal, and they're not doing incremental innovation, somehow helping someone to do more, to show that they are relevant for the business, there's a real problem. And these are the labs that we read about where everybody gets canned. Oh, we're gonna start it, we're gonna start over again, we're gonna fire you know, half of our innovation lab staff and, and we're gonna reset um, because whatever big plan may not have worked, but there was insufficient other small wins along the way. So um, having a grand plan without a series of milestones is absolutely fatal. When are we gonna get the blockchain so that we can fire all our black back office people? Next year, when? And another, another year after that. So you gotta think about innovation as a long game of poker. It's not a single roll of the dice. You're not gonna be in there um, throwing your dice and hoping to get seven or 11, right? On an individual project or on an individual throw of the dice. You're gonna be playing poker. And poker is a long game where you have to read the other players, right? And you as a lab person need to be able to read the other place, 
uh, players in order to be successful. Hans, it's over to you. Yes, a question by Francois. Shouldn't labs only be facilitators? I don't under, sh should labs only be facilitators? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. Um, facilitators in, I guess, in what sense? Should they be facilitating the innovation that is happening at the business units? Is that's that how we, yes. Um, that, well, that's how, how, how I understand the question indeed. Okay, great. Well, Francois, thank you for the question. I love it. And the answer is being a facilitator is wonderful. I think it's a great space for labs to be in, in the sense that you are helping other business units to actually um, do something new or innovate or use new software or somehow do something different. At the same time, if you are only facilitating, um, that's good, but it would be wonderful and a better position for the lab to be able to come up with unique and individual specific ideas on its own. Okay, so it's a mix of both. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't be a facilitator. You certainly should, and I think that's great. By the way, being a facilitator has one really great point to it. You can tap into the money of the, of the, of the business groups who you're facilitating for. Hey, you want the software? You want some development done? Tap in, please help. We're, help. we're only helping you. You need to pay for this. And that's actually really important because I know everybody should laugh at this, ready? lab budgets are very constrained, right? Okay, <laughs> I know I can't, I can hear the laughs coming through the, <laughs> coming through the ether even if I can't hear, see them um, myself. So the answer is being a facilitator is great, but you have to strive to do more. You have to strive to bring in innovation on your own, okay? No. So I think um, that's great. But we do, and, and by the way, this, so that ties in with what we have here, avoid the big plan, be a facilitator, facilitate all over the place, and then have a medium or even a big plan. If your big plan fails, you facilitate it elsewhere and you're good. They're not, gonna, they're not going to say, what did you do for us? Because you can point to what you've been doing. Um, but um, being a facilitator, absolutely, absolutely love it. Another question by Ray, it was about your previous point four. Would the challenge-driven innovation approach address this freedom, quote unquote? Challenge-driven um, means a lot of things to me and I'm gonna to have to guess, I apologize. Um, challenge-driven meaning the business itself comes up with a challenge that you, the lab, are then forced to fix. Is that, does that make sense? It might be. Um, so Ray, if, if you want to clarify, feel free to, uh, to add to your question. Uh, why don't you answer the question already uh, have, building on, let's say, the assumption you're making? Yes, Okay, correct. fine. Yeah. That, that's great. All right. So look, if you're challenge driven, meaning that you're an innovation lab that receives uh, feedback from the business units saying, hey, we need this. I think that's wonderful. It speaks to the very issue of having constraints. You're not sitting there and trying to innovate in a, in a vacuum. Um, I think that's the, that, that, that challenge-based innovation is wonderful. Of course, it depends on the scale of the challenges. Are they actually achievable by the lab or are they such big picture things that it's not realistic to, to assume that you can do it? But challenge-based means the following. Challenge-based means there must be some communication between the business units and the lab in order to make reasonable challenges. Let's assume they're reasonable challenge. And I think that's fantastic. You are ahead of many other labs. I congratulate you. Thanks, Rich. Let's, um, I, I see more questions coming in, but I think they're more general. So why don't we go first through your presentation and then address these questions? Sure. We're, I think we're almost done here. Buying, building versus buying. You would not be your own dentist, would you? Of course not. You know, going to the dentist is not something that you do at home self-help. Now, what really amazed me is how many innovation labs are out there building code. That never ceased to amaze me. Now, look, I'm at IBM and we built, I had 10 people, nine, you know, nine of nine or 10 of them were, every one of them was a coder and because they had to be, because they had to show 
what IBM technology could do at a client's for a, pl cl a client's problem, right? They're all building POCs, so I get that. But what amazed me is how many innovation labs were tasked not just to find a solution, but to actually build operable code. And that's just nuts. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, acquiring technology from a vendor is almost always cheaper than it is to build it in-house. Why? Especially if you're looking at new fintech or new technologies, you can buy it from small startup companies whose cost labor costs are a fraction of the labor costs for people working at a large bank insurance company or any large you know multinational company that would have a lab so i was completely shocked to find so many actually building technology going in there rolling up their sleeves and guys coding and i or, and ladies coding and it made to me it made no sense now i understand we talked about budgets a while ago right i understand that budgets are very limited in labs which I would say is a problem in how they are started up in the first place, because this message has to be transported up to sea level execs where the labs need funds to buy POCs, to buy coding, and to acquire from outside these capabilities. So you can really look, especially in, look, I work in FinTech. You can look at three guys at a bank, four, four people at a bank, and they're looking at some solution. In Singapore, you could probably find a small fintech company of a dozen people already looking at that same solution. And they've been working on it for a year or two years. Your innovation lab has only been working at it for two or three months. Who knows more, right? So the concept of you actually building is problematic. Now, I don't argue that you need to build AI, blockchain, or something else to understand how these technologies work and to get good at it. I get that. I'm not saying you should never build. But beyond the educational factor for your team and the, and, and the people around you, beyond that, you should be going to people who are experts at this so that they can build it, so that they can, you can buy their expertise and it's going to be cheaper for you. You're going to get a superior product product. And the goal is seamless integration. That's what you want. And I know it's hard, but building, um, building production code should really not be the goal of an innovation lab. And I never cease to be amazed at how many labs are sitting there and they're trying to actually build production code that's going to go live. It, it just, it just amazes me. Now this, this, how do you put in picture poor project management? I ask you. Pretty tough, right? So here's my, here's my concept for this. On the left, we have two zombie minions. Okay, these are zombies because I believe that every innovation lab out there has something that I would call a zombie project. Some project that you roll out for management or for visitors that they have to see because you need to show that you're innovative you're innovative and that zombie project is something that you probably in your heart of hearts believe will never happen but you still have it on the books and it's a zombie in that it is consuming resources of your team and my point to you is that's poor project management you it is humane to kill off using the ax. So it is humane to kill off these zombie projects. So as I know it's a stretch, but that's the best I could do with pictures, but I think it's pretty good. I thought the zombie minions were great. But the point is this, we need to be very, labs don't have a lot of resources. We are limited to the number of people we have and we have to become very, very good at project management. And that's very sad because we have to kill off projects that we really, really love. And I know that's hard, but it is humane. Uh, uh, innovation hates a schedule. We don't like to be able to say, look, um, you know, this innovation is going to happen next week or within, three, or within two months. We'll be done in six months. I know it doesn't work like that. I've done this stuff. We don't know when we're going to finish up on this stuff, on a lot of projects. But we have to be very careful that we're not bleeding resources 
from other projects that might just be successful to support projects that are what I call these zombie product, uh, projects. So um, being very effective at time management, being super, super careful to make sure that these projects aren't bleeding your resources. And look, I got a great example. I saw it with my own team. You know, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm working on making, you know, whatever project a little better. And I'm like, you know, yeah, okay. I, know, I, I understand myself that it's hard. We love these projects. We want them to work, but that constant half a day, that constant di uh, 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 couple of hours, which turns into a full day, um, can really be holding you back from achieving more. And it is really hard, but it is better to kill some of these projects off than it is to keep them alive. Um, and uh, hackathons, I don't remember putting this one in, but it's here. Um, my personal experience with hackathons, and I know I get a lot of pushback on this, are that you should just say no. Now, let me be very careful what I'm saying. I actually love internal hackathons where you bring people out of the different businesses and help them understand what innovation about. I think that's fantastic. And I think you should do that. But student hackathons where you bring the local university in and everybody gets together and they have a hackathon. We did it. I was around a bunch of them. The if a company, you're, many of you are working with very large multinationals. If you really want, and I'm also a former MBA school professor here in Shanghai, if you really want to help students learn, you should be pushing executives into the various universities and having them lecture. Before the one hackathon we did, we went in and we lectured. Uh, we had about six or seven different execs, one, some from the bank, some from IBM. And we went in and we held lecture series. Now, when we lectured, we had 150 plus people in the, in the classroom, in, the, in, the, in the, the theater, right? When we eventually selected the teams for the actual hackathon, you know, we actually got maybe 50 or something. Hey, we were reaching a lot more people and the young people were learning a lot more when we went in and lectured them than when we brought them in for a weekend and had a hackathon. Now that's my personal bias and I, I get pushback on this a lot, but in most cases, your institution is not going to use the innovation that the young people come up with. And in most cases, ready? This is a terrible thing to say. Big companies use this as free PR. They get the newspapers to come in, they take lots of pictures, they show that they're doing a hackathon and everybody feels really good and innovative. It's like, you know, it's like the feel good hour. But in reality, very little comes out of it. Now, the concept of flipping it, and getting your employees to come in is wonderful. That's where I think there's real value where you can actually have an employee hackathon and get more of your staff to understand what innovation is about. Love it, support it, and I think it's a fantastic um, way to teach people. So um, look, I have summarized these into what I call best practices. Now Hans has come in, let me just finish the sentence and then we'll, we'll send it to you. Um, best practices, I do not believe that there is a set of rules for innovation labs or programs. They are far too diverse. If I were to talk to all of the people online, I would be shocked at how many different missions you have, how differently you're set up, but no rules, okay? But there are best practices, which generally you can pick from to start a discussion among your stakeholders and to use to make your uh, lab better. Now, these are what I call the best practices for innovation culture. I'm gonna to skip to Hans first before we finish up on these. Thanks, Rich. A question by Raphael. How do labs align lean processes with big scale business as usual processes from the main company? Can you repeat? I apologize. No problem. How do labs align lean processes with big scale business as usual processes from the main company? 
Ah, the answer is with, gr with great difficulty. <laughs> Look, you have a fundamental problem always extant in any laboratory. And that is you have your resources, you have innovation that you wanna bring in and you have another team Let's just say you're taking, let's just take a business, some random business unit in a bank. They have IT support that may be dedicated to them within the, um, the, the IT uh, uh, side. And how do you integrate to make all of what you're doing work with what they want to go, where they want to go? And that's where there is no easy solution. You need to be a superb salesperson and you need to basically be very nice to everybody and hope that they will work with you. Now, let's be realistic here. If you've got the blessing, for lack of a better word, of the business manager and he says, look, we want these innovations and you have to push them through. Yes, you can push and you can get it all done. But that's the best scenario. The worst scenario is where you have limited support you have an IT department that says, we want it this way because it's the most stable and it's the way that we've done it for 15 years. And how are you, the innovator, going to come in and change their mind? So in that situation, you're between what they call a rock and a hard place. You're, you're, you have to go in very gently and try to show how the gains of the innovation will offset whatever changes in the IT structure or in the IT platforms. It's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. That is one of the hardest jobs of an innovator. And I have, not today, but I have another section that I deleted and it's called all about the difference between chief innovation officer and the chief IT guy. Because remember, IT departments are people who maintain code or are responsible for the tech of a division. Their goal is stability, not screwing up and not getting in trouble for anything going wrong. That's, that's what they live their life for. And you as the innovator have the opposite perspective. You wanna come in and you wanna make a breakthrough. You understand that there's gonna be risks in, to any transition and you have to make the best out of it. Um, you, and you wanna make the best out of it. It's a tough one. I have no, I have no magic Dr. Strange powers that can make that any easier. We do have a session on Thursday, I think, uh, on scaling up where uh, the, the speaker, Frank Mattis, will go into a bit more detail. I don't think he has the final answer because no one has, but there's probably some more substance on that. Uh, uh, I have more, more, more uh, thoughts on that as well. Uh, Walter is asking, um, what are your thoughts on keeping the innovation momentum going? You know, it's really interesting. I don't see it slowing. Look, I, I, you know, I work in this business and I'm shocked. <laughs> I, you know, when I started writing the book, I'm looking and I remember I showed you the, the Google searches. When I started seeing all the labs, even I said, ah, this is going to slow down. I better write faster. And I'm not joking. I really was writing as fast as I can to get the book done. And what shocks me to this day is when I look at the new announcements for innovation labs, they're no longer maybe in a Fortune 500 or 100 company because they already have them. I looked at innovation labs for, and I'm not making this up, there was one that really cra cracked me up. It was an innovation lab, and it, yes, it makes sense, an innovation lab for plush, meaning soft, chairs and upholstered, upo soft plush upholstered seating. They developed an innovation lab for this, which, you know, wow, and fine, why not? But the point is the innovation labs are turning up in places. I saw a library innovation lab. I'm seeing them going into government, government innovation labs. And, and sadly enough, yes, I saw this one just, uh, I saw this one like three or four days ago. It made me sad. It was about a warfare innovation lab as part of the US government. They had a new innovation lab designed for warfare. You know, right, you knew this was gonna happen, but it is amazing how innovation is, and innovation labs are percolating out there and there's more of them, not less of them every day. 
Gori is asking, while implementing transformational innovation within an, within an innovation lab framework, how and in what ways can we collaborate better with other innovation labs? That's a real tough one. Um, look, and you know, it's, look, it's an interesting one. And let me tell you my own experience. I am very biased against this. And the reason is when I was in Singapore, I saw tons of cross laboratory agreements. Look, we had at the time we had Lattice 80, which was famous. They're in Hong Kong. They're a great lab. I love them. I have nothing bad to say about Lattice 80. Love the guys. But there were tremendous numbers of cooperational agreements between one lab and another. They would make the news. I would see the announcement. I go to the lab or I go someplace a month later, two months later, and I'm like, great. You got the deal with Sweden. Where are the Swedes? I'm looking for them. Well, they're not quite here. So a lot of these lab to lab um, agreements are rather fuzzy and I'm not sure my personal bias is that they don't produce. Now, a couple of caveats, all right? If you're working with a very specific, now this one may sound self-serving, but I no longer work for IBM, all right? There are a number of labs, IBM labs, Visa and MasterCard, for example, both have innovation labs. These are labs designed specifically for other innovation teams to use. So if you're talking about a lab to lab uh, agreement and the other lab is specifically set up for Visa credit cards, how to use or enable Visa payment at some higher or better or innovative level, and that, line, does, does, that lab is specifically designed to service a third party, no problem. But that, I would say, is the minority of labs out there, not the majority. If you're just going to say, hey, look, I wanna, I'm, I'm working for Commerzbank, the German bank, or I'm working for Deutsche Bank, and I want to do uh, a combination with DBS in Singapore, because Deutsche Bank and DBS are both there in Singapore, and our labs want to work together. What, you think that DBS is going to give you their best ideas? Or you, Deutsche Bank, are you going to give DBS your best ideas? Okay. Interesting. Raphael is asking on the slide, buy, don't, don't build. Um, doesn't external POCs bring other issues like culture and product clashes, like a scale, maturity from the startup and so on? So how to deal with them when integrating with startups? I don't, don't know. The answer is yes. You br Okay, first thing, is are you bringing scale issues? And then that the scale issue depends. Is it a large FinTech with systems that are up and running somewhere or is it three people and two computers, you know, who are very young? So we have to be very careful about who you're doing the POC with. But let's imagine for a moment that you're doing a POC with, an or with some organization that has uh, systems that are up and running somewhere. Um, my argument to me to you would be that you will gain more from tapping into their knowledge if they are knowledgeable about the particular area, and they should be, that you want them for. You will gain more from learning from them than you will lose in trying to manage the process. Basically, what you talk to me about are process management issues. How do we scale? How do we integrate? And those are real issues, and I'm not making light of them. They are terribly difficult. But the bigger issue is, do they know more than your team? And if you pay them for a POC, will you learn more in the three or four months that they're doing the POC than you would be for three or four months studying this stuff on your own? Because this other company already may have it live at your competitor <laughs> at someplace else. And that's, and that's the reality. So no solution to your problem. You just have to balance, does the gain offset the difficulty in managing. No argument. Thanks for answering these questions, Rich. I'm, <clears throat> I'm curious to your uh, kind of uh, uh, last notes that you already started on, but now uh, the floor is yours to finish them. Sure, look, we're gonna finish this up real quickly. We're getting near to the end of our session. And I want a special shout out to two people who said they were gonna be here and it's Anna Lindbergh from Deloitte in Australia 
and Rilani DaCosta from Rat Labs. And I'm gonna hold on, I'm not making that up. It's R-A-T, Rat Labs. So Rinali, R R Rinalini, thank you very much for being here. And Anna, great to, great to not quite see you, but I hope you're there somewhere. Um, so we're gonna finish up now really simply. There are best practices for your innovation lab. And I've got a dozen of them here. Are there more? Probably, but these are the main issues. Now, who has been around a consultant who said, you need to bring an innovation culture into your company? Who, raise your hand. I know I can't see it, but half of you or three quarters of you are probably, actually 90% of you are like, yeah, I've been to that consultant's speech, right? And what concrete, objectives did they give you for changing innovation culture? Probably one or two, make your C-level people aware of innovation, get buy-in from the most C-level, right, forget it. Hold on, if you can work with some portion of these best practices, you will by default bring a culture of innovation into your company. Now I'm saying that and you're like, well, you're, you gotta be kidding me. No, think about it. If you look at all of these different things, discipline project management, good calculation of ROI. These are just randomly from the slides. We didn't, from the slider, we didn't cover them all. Um, if you look at all of these things, they will by themselves generate this culture of innovation that we all want. Okay, so that's key. And I'm gonna to skip to the last slide right now. Um, I don't wanna kill it because there's just so much, there's so much more to talk about and I look forward to meeting you all. I want to connect with you all on LinkedIn. Um, I wanna hear from you. If you think I'm really wrong, send me a message and tell me why I'm wrong. I love those. I get, I get people telling me I'm wrong all day long. I'm an innovator, I'm used to it and so are you, right? So I look forward to hearing from you. But one final thought we can go back and we can take all of these pain points, all of these symptoms, and we can actually, like a doctor, look at what are called constellations of symptoms. So if you have, if your company has innovation theater, it's not just one thing, it's multiple issues that are happening at your company all at once that are bringing you that. Mal, if you're lacking a mission, what I call mission malpractice to go with the medical theme. Again, you've got some combination of these that are all happening at once. And when you're in this situation, which I outline in the book, you're really in for a lot because you've got to change many things. Okay, so look, best practice, there are concrete actions that help you build the culture of innovation. And that's what we all want to do, all right? So, build that culture of innovation. Forgive me, I'm gonna say this, buy my book because it's great, but really buy my book because, ready? You can keep this on your desk. And the next time you have a problem with somebody, either in management or around you, you can open it up, highlight the passage and say, look, that's not a best practice. Now, you think that's stupid, it's not. The book is a framework to bring that discussion forward. And maybe there is a disagreement and maybe my book is wrong, but if it helps to start your discussion with the other stakeholders, it's done its job and I am happy. I wrote the book because I was sad to see so many young people miserable at labs. And I really mean it. I'm gonna, I'll look, I'm old, I'm in my 50s. For lab people that is old these days, right? But the point is, I lived through this. I lived through the pain of innovate, being an innovator for years. And when I saw young people who were not happy with their work and wanted more, that's really what inspired me. So I hope the book helps you. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. And I really do look forward to hearing from all of you um, in the next, uh, either on playback when this gets played sometime in the future or within the next couple of days. Thank you so much. And Hans, thank you.